All right, so as we touched on in the previous video, when we consider globalization, the first thing we need to understand is the globalization of markets. And this effectively refers to the merging of what was previously separate nationally based markets into a single global marketplace. And this has been both uh, driven by and also encouraged, uh, further encouraged and reinforcing uh, the falling barriers to trade and investment that we see all around the world. What we tend to find is that the globalization of markets tends to be less common in consumer products. Absolutely, we are seeing converging consumer tastes where a lot of us in Australia, for example, a lot of the products that we eat uh, and drink are American or overseas uh, owned uh, products and come from overseas owned companies. But we do at the same time also see a number of national tastes which remain significant and separate from those which are evident around the world. A good example here, for example, <laughs> is the old Australian Parmesan. The Parma is a, an institution in many Australian restaurants here and yet if you go overseas you will struggle to find it. Uh, in many, many countries. So there isn't that overlap, that crossover in a lot of these consumer-based industries. It is more important in the markets for industrial goods and materials, on the other hand. So these standardized products and in industries like oil, aluminium, microprocessors, things which do largely the same job irrespective of what country they are operating in. Although I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing with oil what that guy just did. What we tend to find is, as a, is that as a consequence, rather, global firms are both the winners, Charlie Sheen style, and also the drivers of globalization. That is, those firms which uh, internationalize and set themselves up to compete on an international scale are clearly driving globalization. They're bringing the world closer together, but also setting themselves up to be the, the greatest beneficiaries of that process and take advantage of all the wonderful opportunities which globalization has to offer them. On the other hand, we have the globalization of production, and now this reflects the tendency amongst firms to source goods and services from countries that have either lower factor costs, which relates to things like lower land costs, labor costs, and capital costs, or on the other hand, higher quality, or perceived higher quality at least. So we've seen a number of examples of firms who have absolutely outsourced parts of their businesses and their value chains to take advantage of either lower costs or higher quality. Firms like Gap, like Nike, Apple, Pacific Brands have all been highly recognized as, as doing exactly that. That then necessitates firms actually looking at their value chain and their operations on a global scale and saying, well, where is value actually being created and added here? Is it in the product design? Is it in our marketing functions, our manufacturing, our sales? Where that value is being added will potentially, or is, or is in fact likely, to influence where you are going to establish your global operations. A great example here is Apple, as we said before. Apple with their iPhones have not only identified where they can save money by lowering their factor costs by establishing operations overseas, but also taking advantage of higher quality inputs into their iPhones by uh, locating other parts of their operations in higher uh, value adding countries. So to illustrate that, the old iPhone contains, for example, of course it is a, a Apple is an American firm, and yet the accelerometers, whatever they are, in no, they are a, a mechanical part in the iPhone is sourced from Germany. The batteries are from South Korea. The camera uh, is from Japan, a country which has a highly uh, or well developed uh, reputation for high quality inputs and, and certainly cameras. Uh, the mixed signal chips are from the Netherlands. The touch ID sensor was developed in Taiwan and the assembly, the final assembly is typically carried out in China. So it is very much a global product and, and is, as I said before, um, a lot of those different parts are based all around the world depending on which, uh, whether they are seeking to lower their factor costs or add higher quality inputs. It's therefore becoming much less relevant to speak of national products. Instead, we tend to look at global or international products. And in fact, I challenge you to think of any industry these days which is purely nationally based. They just don't really exist anymore. 
On the other hand, there absolutely are some government regulations which have been put in place through both formal and informal barriers to trade which do impede this process. And we're going to look at government intervention in a few weeks' time, but it's important to understand here that there, while uh, globalisation does seem to be a, a omnipresent, uh, unstoppable force, that doesn't mean that governments don't put some regulations in place to try and at least control that process to some degree. Let's move now to the drivers of globalisation, those factors that are actually making it more and more powerful and more common in our everyday lives. We touched already on the declining trade and investment barriers and the growth of multinational enterprises rather than just singular singularly national companies. This has resulted in the freer flow of capital and other factors of production like goods and services. But interestingly, not so much labour. Anybody who's tried to work overseas will understand the intricacies involved in things, sourcing things like uh, visas. So it's not necessarily become easy to work overseas. But most of the other factors of production, it absolutely has been easier to transfer those. Technological factors have played a large part here as well, of course. We've talked about the internet, the WWW, not to be confused with the WWF and absolutely not confused with the WWE. No, we are talking about the World Wide Web here and the resulting and related issues uh, in terms of things like micro development of microprocessors, telecommunications, globally dispersed production systems, and different forms of e-commerce, uh, especially those things like lower cost computing. It's so easy to jump on the internet these days and to, uh, or, or to something like Skype and jump on and speak to a family member or a, indeed a business partner on the complete other side of the world. The important thing, of course, is to make sure that if you're telling your partner you are in off an office, you are actually at work. Environmental standards have been another huge contributing factor. One of the key things that we've seen established over the last couple of decades is the recognition that we need to develop global standards if we are to solve the issue of environmental sustainability. And this is now seen as part of a firm's social responsibilities beyond simply just making profit. Uh, it's important that we develop uh, these global rather than just national standards if we are to, as a, as a, a human race in effect, solve this issue of environmental sustainability. We've also seen uh, the issue of civil society play a large part in the push towards globalisation. The establishment of firms like Greenpeace, which are uh, effectively set up to establish global standards in relation to things like whaling, and also Amnesty International, which seeks to establish global standards in relation to things like human rights. Um, there's been a big push from these types of organisations towards establishing global standards in their particular area of expertise, which again has reinforced this issue of globalisation. Finally, we've also seen the globalisation of culture more broadly, and that is the homogenisation or the assimilation through cultural institutions, things like cinema, music, literature, and especially social media. These days, it is so easy to jump on Facebook and actually get in touch with somebody, again, on the complete other side of the world to stay in uh, touch with your contacts, your business partners, or indeed your group members and just tell them all about them week nine feels. We've all been there, I understand it just as well as you guys do. <laughs> the key thing to take away here though is that all of these factors have contributed to this increasing interconnectedness of the globe, uh, which has made it easier and easier for businesses to do uh, their, to, or to compete and operate on an international scale. Just to finish this video, this the emergence of globalisation has, uh, not surprisingly, also seen uh, resulted in and, and contributed towards the uh, the emergence rather of global institutions. So as we've seen more and more multinational enterprises, uh, these firms expanding internationally to. Uh, compete on a global scale, so we've also seen the establishment of these global institutions to effectively monitor and police uh, the, their global operations. So we see firms like, or, or organisations like the WTO, the World Trade Organisation, who have been set up to effectively police the world trading system, hopefully a little bit better than our friends in Team America, although some would say perhaps not. They aim at least to ensure that nation states adhere to the rules laid down in trade treaties and promoting also these lowering of barriers to trade and investment. 
Similarly, the International Monetary Fund seeks to maintain order in the international monetary system. The World Bank promotes economic development, while the United Nations seeks to maintain international peace and security and enhance those positive relations amongst nations. This is especially important uh, given the current situation that we see in North Korea and the push from America and other nations for uh, the United Nations to actually step in there and sort of if not completely solve, at least assist in that uh, perhaps tense situation and relationship that we see at the moment.